How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. As a listener of DNA Today, you've probably heard me talk about NIPT, non-invasive prenatal screening or testing that looks for extra or missing chromosome conditions during pregnancy. But did you know there's one that can also screen for recessive disorders like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, and fetal antigens? Billion to One offers Unity Screening, which does all of this from one blood draw from a pregnant person. Visit unityscreen.com for more information and stay tuned for our upcoming episodes with Billion to One, exploring non-invasive prenatal screening for recessive conditions and red blood cell fetal antigens. My guest today is Franz Pufer. He is a pharma and biotech entrepreneur, and he's the founder of Maxwork Biotech and Certis Therapeutics. In this episode, I'm learning from France about microfluidics, which is a topic that I know very little about, which is exciting because (laughs) I get to learn alongside you listeners. So France, thank you so much for coming on and sharing with this topic that I think I've mentioned in episodes, but we've never really dived into it. So I'm really excited about this one. Yeah, thank you very much, Kara, for inviting me to your podcast. Yeah, yeah. So I think we should start with the question on a lot of people's minds that are listening to this, what is microfluidics? We've got to start there. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, microfluidics is a study and manipulation of fluids at a very, very small scale as it names, it name says microfluidics. And for that, you need to have a fluid inside the very, very tiny vessels on the micro level and microfluidics. It's a field that involves physics specifically, fluid mechanics and engineering. And actually throughout time, uh, microfluidics has evolved into a truly multidisciplinary field involving chemistry, biochemistry, nanotechnology, biotech, tissue engineering, you name it. Pretty much like so many fields have converged to in, this, uh, in, the, uh, in the development of microfluidic uh, technologies and applications. So it's, it's a very diverse and rich field that it's evolving at a very fast pace in the past uh, years and it's going to give uh, well it's going to give lots of progress we're going to we're going to start hearing more about it in the near future yes it's i wouldn't say it's a household name now but maybe in the future people are going to know a lot more when we mention yeah. microfluidics they're going to be like i listened to dna today back in you know 2023 no but so when i was starting to research some of this it's like microfluidics, it sounds like a brand new technology, but that's not the case. So when did microfluidics, I guess, either when the term was starting to be used or when this specific type of technology was being developed and used? Like, what timeline are we talking about here? Yeah, actually, yeah, the technology itself, uh, the microfluidic fills comes back from the 70s with the development Whoa, of that's like micro- 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. And actually, it was not really microfluidics, but it comes from the microelectronic industry from that uh, from the 1970s. And well, that, but actually, like the first paper where they use an actual microfluidic device, it's in 1979. And they don't they don't use actually the term microfluidics. Actually, I don't know when was the first time that someone decided to use the term microfluidics, but the first paper that they mentioned, well, that they, they actually built a microfluidic device it's in the late 70s. So, yeah, it's a, it's a technology that has already many years and, well, it has, it has evolved a lot since then. Yeah, and, and as you were mentioning, I mean, it touches so many different areas within technology and science. What are some applications of microfluidics if we're focusing more on the healthcare side? Well, yeah, that's a big, that's a big, big question. Yeah, it's still a big question. It's smaller than where we started, <laughs> but it's still a big question. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. Well, the current and potential applications for microfluidics and healthcare are really, really, really enormous. They are really huge. In. And actually, well, the first applications in the biological area, it was like mid-90s, 94, something like 94. And it was used for DNA separation and analysis and electrophoresis. For, to do, the idea was to do high-throughput DNA separation. And that actually was an important step that helped for the genome sequencing to have this, uh, this high-throughput DNA separation that was done by microfluidics. And, well, yeah, nowadays, well, the applications are ranged from genomics, microarray technologies, single-cell genomics, liquid biopsies in cancer. As you know, it's also big, big fill, liquid biopsies, in which you can analyze by microfluidics both uh, circulating tumor cells as well as non-circulating tumor cells like exosomes or so many different biological components. So microfluidics plays a very, very big uh, has a very big impact in the micro in the like liquid biopsy, as well. Also, it's a there's a very interesting field that it's a, where you actually can have like organs. You have for of course the organs on the chip, and actually in this microfluidic chip you can simulate physiological parameters, and that's super super cool because, uh, for example, you can have like a lung, you can have a liver, you can have a brain area in which you're actually simulating different parameters. And actually, since you have a flow, you can recapitulate in some sort, and there's a lot of development in that area about the, uh, well, circulatory effects, flow effects, and how it, cells interact with each other. So it's a super cool area. And well, that, that, that also, it's not only for research, like also for testing like new drugs. For new drugs, it's a very interesting area of development. Because as you know, now like in the preclinical area, most of the drugs are tested by, well, they are tested, of course, with animal, different animal models. But yeah, animal models, of course, they are not perfect. No model is perfect. Also microfluidic models are not perfect. No model is perfect actually, but yeah, it gives you, it can give you like lots of different things like actually that you are using actually human, you can use human tissue and you can pretty much like simulate what's happening and what's happening with the drug compound when you put it inside a chip. So there's like lots of potential happening in that area. Also in the, in the field from tumor microenvironment, which well, it really exploded. Tumor microenvironment, I remember back, well, some early 2000s, it was really a field that was like a niche field that very few people were aware of. And suddenly after all this uh, checkpoint inhibitors and all the immune uh, all these immune therapies, like the field exploded, and now pretty much every single lab in cancer research is doing some sort of tumor microenvironment. And something cool about uh, microfluidics is that you can simulate like a lot of what's happening in the tumor microenvironment. Because as you know, also in cancer research, first it was like a lot of, uh, they were focusing a lot in the cancer cell itself and the, its genome but then they realize like the importance of the cells adjacent to the cancer cells. And you can study that in animal models, but again, they are not perfect and they do not recapitulate many aspects of uh, human tumor biology. And with a microfluidic chip, you can start playing with that. You can start playing with that also, trying to simulate the tumor microenvironment. Also when it goes to metastasis to the uh, target tissue, the metastatic, uh, tissue and then you can like very easily like measure parameters of what's happening because at the end it's inside a chip so pretty much you can be measuring even real-time parameters of that are changing like RNA expression of different cells then you also can do like single 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 cell analysis from that tumor microenvironment so there's like a huge huge thing happening there and actually it's one of the fields that I'm excited about in the tumor microenvironment that's super cool so there are, well, many, many potential applications. And of course, uh, point of care. Point of care, it's uh, also a very big potential application for microfluidics in which you can, um, you pretty much can bring this to, well, to the, well, to the patient, to the doctor-patient interface and where you can do multiple tests. So it's, we're, we're still, of course, not, 
yet there, but definitely the future is going in that direction. So it's a tremendous, like the amount of uh, potential in healthcare that it's for microfluidics, it's advancing at a very fa fast pace. It has many applications, research and development, drug discovery, healthcare. So it has like a, well, it's a, it's a very exciting field. It really is. And, and I was learning a little bit about that there's different kind of microfluidic systems. So everything you're mentioning, it's not like it's just one setup in a laboratory, that there's different types um, of these systems. Can you explain a couple of them or kind of like how that works? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's that's actually, there, there's a lot, a lot of development on the different microfluidic systems. But in general, we could uh, classify them as um, open, what are open systems, open microfluidics, which I will explain a little bit more about them. And continuous f flow, or probably, yeah, continuous flow and like in, in case microfluidics. So the o in the open microfluidics, you have a system in which, uh, as you can imagine, microfluidics, so you have like tiny vessels, tiny channels, which are in the micrometer scale or even, even less, nanometer scale. And so what, happen what happens in the, micro in the microfluidics is in the open microfluidics, you have like an open area, which is in contact with the air. So that has, a, it has certain advantages, but also disadvantages. Actually, one of the fields that it's moving into that direction is the paper microfluidics. Paper microfluidics is a field which, uh, in which they make like the micro channels with wax and other type of hydrophobic materials so that, the, so that you can have like the tiny channels in, on paper. And it's open to the atmosphere, so it has it has a, it has problems, has many limitations. Like as you can imagine, the evaporation rate because it's an open system, and but of course it has advantages like uh, probably price. It's difficult to say now at this point, but yeah, it has. It's still like a still like a field that it's developing, and maybe in the future, open fill open microfluidics can be like the like the next thing. It's, it's hard to say now. The other system is like the case or also like a where the system is completely closed. So the channels are closed, everything is closed. And in that system, so you need like an external so source of pressure. You need something that gives pressure. And there are many ways of developing that pressure because as you know, pressure is what drives flow. You need that differential pressure to have flow in, a, in any system. And there are many different mechanisms. They were using a, like a lot of syringes in the past. And now they have evolved to more complex uh, micro pumps and things that can be can be more accurate. Also, at some point, they were using peristaltic pumps, which have advantages but also disadvantages. So there are many ways of generating that pressure. And so you have in this system the closed system, and you have like the components in the closed environment, also the reagents. And there, there's there's also another one which is uh, it's quite interesting and has uh, has gathered like lots of attention in the field, especially like for single cell analysis, in which is the droplet-based microfluidics. And that's, well, that's also another type of, that's another type of mechanism of system that it's also evolving rapidly. But so pretty much we could classify them, yes, open systems and closed systems. And from the closed systems, we have like continuous flow, where there's a continuous flow, and the droplet base, which is, even though the, fl the flow is continuous, we can say it's discrete in some way because it has like single packages moving, which are the droplets. So that's pretty much how, yeah, I could classify them like open, closed, and from the closed systems, you get the continuous and the non-continuous systems. Yeah, that's, that's really cool just how many different ones there are and then like what makes sense in what scenario and what area um, of science that you're talking about. It If you've been listening to DNA Today for a while, you probably know I'm also a full-time prenatal genetic counselor. Between that job, this podcast, and being a producer host of other podcasts, I'm pretty busy. So to keep up my energy and stay productive, I drink a decent amount of coffee. Think like Lorelai Gilmore, but maybe not quite that much. The new coffee I'm drinking is from Four Sigmatic, and I'm really picky about my coffee. It's got to be bold, not watery. That is the worst. I still drink it if I have to, but it's not my favorite. And I have to say, I've been really happy with Four Sigmatic. Here's the difference from other coffees. It includes mushrooms, which I know sounds bizarre. I will admit I was hesitant, but you don't taste the mushroom at all. 
and you get the health benefits from it. I like the immune system boost as I often get sick in the winter months. So this is really important. And I wanted to team up with Four Sigmatic to get you 30% off using promo code DNA today. And you can redeem it at foursigmatic.com. Again, that's four, spell it out, F-O-U-R, Sigmatic, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com. Use code DNA today for 30% off. And let me know if you like it too. Non-invasive prenatal testing screening has been around for a decade now, as long as DNA Today, and the technology has evolved in those 10 years. The screening started to detect Down syndrome, and now Billion to One's Unity screen assesses for the chance for pregnancies to have aneuploidies, which are extra missing chromosome conditions, recessive conditions like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell, and the presence of red blood cell fetal antigens. Billion to One named the screening Unity Screen as it brings together fetal screening for aneuploidies and recessive conditions. And it represents uniting pregnant patients in more equitable care. Unity does not require a blood sample from the other biological parent or sperm donor to assess fetal risk. This enables more pregnancies at risk to be affected with recessive conditions to be identified early in pregnancy as compared to traditional carrier screening. Billion to One is working towards one goal, to detect disease one molecule at a time. No early with one simple blood test. Visit unityscreen.com for more information. And stay tuned for our upcoming episodes with Billion to One, exploring non-invasive prenatal screening for recessive conditions and red blood cell fetal antigens. About it. And one thing that you've been bringing up is single cell studies, which I think the concept you know, in itself is just crazy to me that you can yeah, it is. test one cell. Like, it's just mind blowing to me. So how does that really work when we're testing one cell? Because usually when, when we're talking about testing, we're taking, you know, especially if we're talking about genetic testing, we're taking lots of DNA from many, many cells and then running that. But when you're talking about a single cell, I mean, how does that even work? What, how does that fit into the different systems you were talking about just now? Yeah, that, that's 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 also a very very good question. And well, the reason that you can perform single cell analysis with microfluidics actually has to do with the scale, because you are talking on the micro scale. So when you have this ability to separate or compartmentalize molecules or cells, it's much easier to really separate individual elements. And now for this, I have like a an, an analogy. Let's say that someone loses a ring. You lose a ring, someone loses a ring on the lake, someone loses a ring in the swimming pool, and the third person loses a ring in the jacuzzi. So who has, who's more likely to find a ring? It's got to be find the jacuzzi. I imagine it's smaller unless it's a very expensive jacuzzi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's much easier in the jacuzzi than you swimming pool. It's easier. And, well, on the lake, it's pretty much impossible. And that's actually the analogy that you get with microfluidics because you scale down so much that you have this ability to really separate the elements. And this not only goes for cells, it also goes for single molecules in which you can detect single molecules. And well, so th this ability to really like narrow down the channels to very, very small spaces, that's, that's, that's a way in which uh, you can separate the uh, you can separate the uh, cells. And actually for that, uh, yeah, I can talk a little bit more about, uh, about this uh, droplet-based microfluidics. If you, yeah, like for understanding how you can actually separate cells, it's like a good thing to, to really, well, get a little bit more detail into. It's like, a, it's a very, it's a complex field as well, which involves like lots of physics, lots of engineering. And in this, in this uh, uh, droplet-based microfluidics, as, as I said, it's in a closed system and it's non-continuous. So you have, you indeed have a continuous flow, but it's non-continuous because you have like a droplet. So you have like a package, like a discrete package that is moving. And how you achieve that? Well, the way you achieve that, you pretty much, you put like a channel that has a fluid, like so let's say like water or similar or similar fluid. And on the other channel, you have uh, you have one that is carrying usually an inert oil, so an hydrophobic material, and then you join them. And when you join them, as you can imagine, you're going to you're going to have you're going to start producing like droplets. Actually, if we drop oil on the water, 
right away we're going to see this droplet. This is pretty much the same principle. This is how this droplet-based microfluidics work. And actually, you also need other components like surfactant agents, which are detergents, to stabilize more this package of... Uh, to this, have little uh, groupings package. almost, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So when you have this cell, you can, you can like focus that cell with certain flow. So you have like a pretty much like in the flow cytometry. So you have like single cells and then you join them with this uh, droplet, droplet, uh, with this dro lipid droplets. So to encase, to encase the, that cell. And that's, that's, that's how you can actually have like single cell analysis. So and, it, cap well, it this, captures the cell like in a droplet. Yeah, that's that right. That's how it works? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It captures the cell in a droplet. And that actually, you can see each droplet. It's very interesting. You can see it like a isolated bioreactor, so to say, also, because you can carry not only cells, you can carry individual reagents, you can carry like lots of things in. And once you have this, you can, you can really like isolate uh, single cells, you can isolate different things, and you can have like different packages. And also by having this droplet mechanisms to avoid, uh, to avoid cross contamination which you, you usually don't want. You, pre, you reduce it like significant, in significantly orders this possibility of having cross-contamination. So it's like, yeah, it's very cool what you can achieve with this uh, droplet, droplet, lipid droplet. And then also you can do with them or all sort of things pretty much. You can separate them by size, as you can imagine, by engineering the size from the channels, by density, by viscosity, by different... Uh, physical parameters. And this is what it would be more like a passive way of separating that uh, droplets, but you also can use like more specific mechanisms, such as, well, when you're using like different components, like electrical components, magnetic, pneumatic, even acoustic, there are like different systems in which you can separate those cells. And you can measure the intensity if it has a fluorescent tag, a fluorescent signal in your cells. So you can you can separate those, or if it's, I don't know, with an antibody with a fluorescent tag, you can do like lots of things like, so you can both actively separate them or passively separate them, or usually you combine both of them. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, it's It allows a very... you to be really specific with exactly what you want is your describing. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so, so tell me this, how do biochips work for tests? Like I'm thinking transcriptome analysis, PCR amplification, like, how does that work? Because that also kind of affects like the genetic space. Yeah. Well, uh, they actually, they pretty much work the same as regular yeah, PCR, except that things are at a smaller scale. You Where it's also like a move... chip, like what, like this big? Like, uh, what am I yeah, like, there like the are small chips. Palm. Sometimes like the slide. Actually, actually, many times it's, well, I don't know because there's like some standards or some things that are embedded on our brains. I don't know, like actually many times there are the size of slides, like pathology slides. And actually there's not like a real reason why that should be, but probably that's our, because we're used to that Yeah, size when I think of something, slide. I'm like, that's, that's a standard size. I don't know who came yeah. up with that, but <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, I don't know. It's like similar, like with the, with the width from the real world that it had many implications, even with the, with the uh, with the space shuttles, something right. that was designed in the 1800s had like lots of implications. Probably it's like similar thing with the slides. Of course, they can be like different sizes, and you can customize sizes and shapes depending on what you want. Because there are even like some uh, like CD CD type of microfluidic devices in which you actually use the centrifugal forces. Actually, the first experiments were do, done in actual CD players, so they wow. use this. They use a centrifugal force. They just put like play and it started to spin and you could, they were like doing like some channels inside the CD. So, so I yeah. get my CD player out. I can start doing what you do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have like different possible, different possibilities of shapes, sizes, but yeah, it's very common to use like a pathology slides. And well, and then for example, for PCR, you use this like very, you use also like very precise thermal electric techniques like Peltier cells, this Peltier heating models, they're like very fast that they can cool and heat like in a very precise manner. And also one advantage that you don't have on the regular PCR machine with, where they also use this Peltier um, uh, heating cooling modules 
is that since you have a flow, because even if thought they are super fast, Pelletier are super fast, they can cool down and, and hit like a super fast rate, but they are not like super, super, super fast. I don't know how to explain it. They are fast, but with microfluidics, you can do it that even faster. Because let's say you have like an area in this area, let's say it's uh, 80 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Celsius. In this area, you cool it down to 70 degrees. So since you're circulating fluid, you can go much, much faster at the colder area or you can really like play with that and you really can't get. So actually you can even get a lot faster results, a p faster PCR results with microfluidic devices. So yeah, it's, uh, you have like many, many different options on how to do it. Yeah, and I imagine the cost is a lot less compared to other standard lab setups because micro you're using less reagents and reagents can often be really expensive. I remember being really shocked when I worked in a lab and yeah. I was working with a uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization, like doing that. So using the probes that had, you know, like I, I was amazed how much each little tiny, you know, uh, half the size of my pinky, how much that would cost. And I wish I remember now, but I remember being astounded. I, I was a college student, so, you know, uh, money was yeah, different back true, then yeah. for me, but I mean, it's so expensive. So the cost is less. And also the amount of sample that you need can also be less, which sometimes I imagine that's really advantageous. Like say you have this sample and it's a tumor sample and it's really small. You can't do a ton of testing on it because you only have so much. Um, so am I getting that right in terms of just like all those types of advantages? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, that, uh, well, reagents, as you know, it's, they are super expensive and they're like a big budget for R&D labs. But that's also a tricky question because, yeah, you indeed, you're spending a lot less in reagents. But, yeah, that's, that's a tricky question because from a research and development perspective, like for a lab perspective, of course, you are saving like lots of reagents when you are doing like this micro, nanoliter, even picoliter uh, instead of uh, like this big uh, 200 microliters or whatever. So you're using like much smaller quantities. But at the same time, this is, I say this is tricky because, and this is something that still needs to be addressed because uh, in the microfluidics, there are still like many challenges and hurdles down the road for scaling up and like a scaling up production, like real commercial production where really costs are, where you actually really see the costs that are very important. And well, there are developments, a lot of developments in that area. And, and as soon as this is scaling up and ramp up, it's really set up. I'm pretty sure that prices are going to decrease in producing. And of course the reagent aspect will be very important, like using less reagents, but we still need like this, uh, like a real scaling up for doing something massive. This is something, something many people are working and well that's that's an exciting area that's now once this is scaling up it's really in place it's going to be a huge difference and also another important thing it's very good that you mentioned about these reagents about the price it's also yeah we saw that uh, during the pandemic during the COVID pandemic there was in the global supply chains there was a shortage of many of the reagents people couldn't get like different set of enzymes that they were do because they were pretty much the world was competing against or not competing like it was giving priority for, of course, like doing tests and all the reagents for doing tests, but also like all all the areas from research had problems with this uh, shortage of many reagents. And of course, if you have like, like this tiny, you are using this tiny amounts of reagents, this shortage in the global supply chain would not happen if you have this in place. And well, that's, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a thing. Yeah, so nowadays regarding cost, I would say that, uh, yeah, and also, well, going back to the part from from price, for this, I think for a, every individual uh, microfluidic platform or technology that emerges, that comes into market, of course, there will be needed like a pharmacoeconomic study where I think probably initially cost will not be the main factor, to be honest. I think it's going to be the benefits, the benefits that on, the, on any pharmacoeconomy analysis. Because pretty much now with microfluidics, you also can do things that you cannot do with our technologies. And that gives like significant advantages for healthcare. And for sure, when this is scaling up, this ramping up 
from uh, to scale up this uh, microfluidic uh, production takes place, prices in that uh, area are also going to decrease. And of course, it's an economy of scale. Of scale and then we're going to see. I, I think at that point we're really going to see like a significantly decrease in healthcare expenditure and tests. In but that's about still scale. like down the road. Yeah, and, and talking about scale there, there is an advantage of using this with being in remote areas too, that this isn't something where you need to go to one big place that has this technology, that this is technology that you can use in like, you know, a remote area, different places in the world where you can be using this technology and you don't have to be near like a huge major medical center or hospital. Um, so, you know, I, I can definitely see that affecting people in, in those areas, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, of course, there are people working on that area. And yeah, that will have also like lots of impact in the point of care area so that you can uh, you can reach this uh, remote areas in both lower and middle income countries. It's going to be it's going to have like a big impact in healthcare and global health care. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, microfluidics is going to have a, a big, uh, yeah, big impact in those areas for sure. Yeah, that, that's a very good point that you bring. Well, I have to say, you gave me a little heads up ahead of time, so I do have to give credit where credit's due there. So one of the reasons I brought you on as a guest is because you're such an expert in microfluidics, as we've been talking about in this episode, and you've really been able to explain everything so well. Now, you have a company that focuses in microfluidics. Can you give us a teaser of upcoming projects you have, what you're working on now? Yeah, well, yeah, we have actually, uh, we have very cool developments in our pipeline that we are using microfluidic technologies. And yeah, well, yeah, for the teaser, yeah, next next time you invite me, I can tell you more about what we're developing uh, because they are really, yeah, they're really cool things and they can really be game changers in the way things are done. Well, that sounds awesome. I, I will take you up on that offer. We'll have to have you back on when you can share exactly <laughs> oh, what thanks. you're doing because it's, uh, it's very secret right now, which is very exciting. So for most of the episode, we've spent talking about applications in the healthcare space, especially genetics and biology, but let's span out from that. What applications are there outside of healthcare? Because, I mean, there's just so many that I was coming across while reading about this. What are a few of them? Well, yeah, there are many. Well, there are many other applications. Yeah, one of them is also, well, bio threats. All the bio defense, which is... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's like uh, something that it's needed, and and yeah, microfluidics can also be a game changer in detecting uh, bio threats at borders, uh, airports, security points. So it's yeah, it's because of the of the way you can perform it without actually having like proper labs or and also at a faster rate. So it, it, for sure, in bio threats, there's like a big role. Also, even. It's like not like the kind of healthcare we are related, but also uh, space medicine. It's going to have like a big role, especially if uh, Mars is going to be colonized. <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah, that'd be important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So of course, microfluidics is going to have a role in that. And all right, I'll, yeah, I'll so... bring you on to my crew as we resettle Mars. I think you'd be one that would be really helpful to bring. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are lots, tons of applications for space medicine and yeah, really like really trying to go to a different atmosphere. There are really cool things that can be done with microfluidics for sure. Yeah, and I guess yeah. a lot of it goes to you can control so much of the environment, as you said, especially yeah. with those like closed system um, yeah, that you were right, talking yeah. about. And I mean, you've certainly showed that you're an expert in microfluidics. That's why I brought you on as a guest today to explore all of this and really teach me and my audience. Um, it makes sense that you have a company that's focused on microfluidics. Can you give us any teaser or what's coming up for you guys in 2023? Yeah, well, yeah, actually we have a very cool, on our pipeline, we have very cool developments that are, that involve microfluidic technologies and yeah, and the diagnostics and well, yeah, yeah, we were hoping to have some new developments uh, at the end of this calendar year, and yeah, we can, yeah, that we can let you. <laughs> oh my God, I don't know how to phrase it. Yikes! You could say <laughs> I'll ha I'll have to come back on to give you the update. You want to finish maybe by saying that? <laughs> sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, I, I wanted to just end with asking you of like, you know, we've, we've looked at the future a little bit, um, but do you foresee that microfluidics might replace standard lab approaches where you have, you have to have a whole lab set up in order to do a test versus having a microfluidic setup where you kind of just like, you know, using it just in that enclosed um, space. Like, do you see this happening? If you do, when do you think that could become the new standard? Yeah, I, I really do not see in the foreseeable future like uh, replacing like a uh, completely standard lab procedures. I think they will... I really think they will stay. Actually, I see like there are actual like complementing technologies, both of things that you cannot do with regular standard lab procedures, things that can help. Where I can see the differences probably are in like in the remote areas where now people don't have access to basic healthcare. That probably in the future I could see that happening. Like having because. Yeah, they really don't have like uh, access to this uh, technology, to this, uh, to this, uh, well, diagnostics. Yeah. And yeah, I think uh, that's a good point in just being able to have that remote areas having access to this as opposed to other things that they don't have access to. Um, so really just being able to have a lot more people just equitable of care and everything and just making things more equal. Um, but thank you so much. I mean, this is just so much information. You're going to have to come back on at the end of the year to just give us updates, I think, on microfluidics and especially what your company is up to and, and any uh, you know big announcements or anything that's coming up. Uh, we'd love to have you back on. Um, but just thank you so much, France, for for explaining this to me. I feel like, I feel like I have a much better understanding than I did half an hour ago. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. All right. It was really, it was really fun also. Yeah. To be uh, all answering these questions and yeah, it's a, uh, it's cool to be here and thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kier Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. DNA. DNA.